the top STEM schools like MIT, Caltech, Stanford become very, very difficult. It almost becomes like a lottery system. Everyone has a high GPA. Everyone has a 2400 on their SAT. And so today I'm going to talk about what you can do to increase your chances into getting into some of these schools. So a little bit about me. I am currently a senior at American High School over in Fremont. Um, if you've ever heard of Mission San Jose High School, we're in the same district. Not many people know about American. Um, I'm interested in many different extracurriculars from soccer to art to science. Um, I particularly have a passion for science, especially biology, and I pursued many biology related activities from the Olympiads to internships. And I am an incoming freshman at, the Stan at Stanford University. I will be attending the School of Engineering under a biomedical computation major, which is a basically it's a double major between biology and computer science. I will be also learning about the integration of biology, engineering, medicine, and computer science. Um, within all four years of students at Stanford, only eight students are able to keep up with this major so far. I will be student number nine in this major. It's very demanding and you don't even have time to minor in anything. Um, so a little inter an overview, I will be talking about my personal experience in high school, my academics, what worked and what didn't work, as well as showing well-roundedness and leadership, uh, the difference between applying to UK schools and US schools, how to play the college lottery, which is really based on your essays and how to appeal to schools like MIT, as well as what uh, your family support, what your parents uh, can do to help you throughout high school and the college application. So let's go to part one, what I did in high school. So my academics, I have a GPA of 3.98 unweighted, um, 4.73 weighted. I am the salutor salutatorian of my high school class. Uh, my SAT one, I had a 2360. Got 40 points off on critical reading, but math and writing were 800. Um, for my subject tests, I took all the math and science subject tests available except for math one, because if you take math two, you really don't need math one. For math two, I had an 800, physics an 800, chemistry an 800, and biology molecular a 790, which I think is ironic because it's my lowest score and I'm majoring in biology. Um, I did all honors in AP classes. By junior year, I had finished 11 AP classes, um, mostly science as well as history and English. Um, during my senior year, I actually ran out of maths to take at American. The highest we go up to is AP Calculus BC and AP Statistics. So I took multivariable calculus at West Valley Community College um, every evening after soccer practice, and I finished the course up with an A. So talking about extracurricular activities, um, colleges, what they really want to see in your extracurriculars is commitment. They want to see that you've dedicated three or four years to an activity and kept going with it. So things that I did, I did FTC and FRC robotics for four years. I actually started in middle school, but I did it through all four years of high school. Um, we were NorCal state championships uh, champions for the games. We also won a lot of design awards and innovation awards. Um, additionally, part of FTC uh, was mentoring and a middle school team, an FLL team. Um, for those of you who don't know what FTC and FRC are, it's FTC stands for First Tech Challenge, um, which is a much smaller robot compared to FRC, which is First Robotics Challenge, where the robots are about half as tall or as tall as I am. Um, and a big part of what I did with FTC and FRC is volunteer to mentor children's teams, uh, middle school teams in first Lego League. Um, they actually did really well. They went to Worlds, which I was very proud of. It was like my own children had gone to Worlds. It was like I had raised a child. Uh, I also, outside of robotics, I also did competitive soccer for four years. I play with the Union City Premier Club. I play um, sweeper and defensive mid. We've won the Fall League Championships many years. Um, we were semi-finalists for the North California State Cup, and we also won first place in several college showcases, such as the Rage Pleasanton Showcase. Um, because of soccer, I did go to the Stanford Soccer ID Camp, which is a week-long summer camp where um, college coaches come out and see if they want to recruit you. I also did competitive art for four years. 
Um, so what competitive art was to me is that I did have a private art teacher, but a lot of the art pieces that I created were designed for competitions. For example, I won international, national, and state awards from the United Nations, um, scholastic writing and art competitions, as well as California. Uh, my art teacher was very proactive in having us enter competitions, and so I had many awards. Um, from the UN, I got a fifth place award internationally. Um, they run a contest every year, and so globally, I placed uh, fifth. For Scholastic, I won the Silver Regional Key, so within all of the West Coast, Hawaii, Alaska, Montana, and Wyoming, I was second. And within California, I had three first place awards, all in drawing. Um, and for me, competitive art was very important. It was something I had dedicated four years to. My other extracurriculars include, uh, I am the founder of a nonprofit organization called Artane. And so um, that I have committed three years to and will continue um, pursuing in college. And so what my nonprofit organization does is that we teach art to underprivileged children. We've arranged ourselves, we've arranged uh, time slots with the local homeless shelter, um, the Fremont Main Library, to teach children art once or twice every week, um, which has been a very big time commitment for me. And we are actually an official nonprofit under California state law, which means uh, my friend and I, we have both had to file a lot of paperwork with the IRS, but we are an official nonprofit. Um, I am also president of our school's Biology Olympiad Club for three years. And the reason I've only committed three years to this is because there previously was no Biology Olympiad at American. And I really have to thank Sherry for helping me get started with that because here at Springlight, uh, there were Biology Olympiad classes and that's what really helped me get interested in this competition. And I was able to go back to school, coordinate with my AP Biology teacher and start this competition. I am also a two-time semi-finalist for the Biology Olympiad, which means I am in the top 10% of the nation for this test. Uh, the first year that I took the Biology Olympiad, I was a semi-finalist with high honors, which means I was the top 60 in the nation. Unfortunately, I never went to camp. Um, I was never a national finalist, which is what you see a lot of kids are these days. They're a finalist in the Math Olympiad, the Physics Olympiad, Chemistry, Computing, Biology Olympiad. And those are all the kids that you're going to compete with to go to schools like MIT. And they do have that one up on you because they are the best in the nation at physics. They are the best in the nation at biology, math, chemistry, computer coding. And so for me, it was very nerve wracking that I was only a semi-finalist. But, but I will be talking about the different things you can do to even though you aren't the best in the nation, how to get into these schools. And then my last slide of extracurricular activities. Um, this is what I do in terms of student activism. So something that I'm very passionate about is students having a voice in their education. And so I, I'm part of two different organizations. One organization is SIR 40. It stands for Students United for the Representation to the Fremont Board of Education. And what it is is a board of students, a committee of students, who represent local student opinions on different education laws. Um, to our local board of education and so what that means is um, one year our board of education decided that they wanted to change math pathways and make it a little bit easier so that when you're in 12th grade you only finish up to pre-calculus um, and so what we did as part of Sir 40 is we gathered student opinions and said hey how would you feel that your math classes are getting a little lower in difficulty as opposed to higher and we gathered that student opinion and we present it to the board of education and those policymakers will take our input and really, um, they'll take their, our input and try, kind of shape policy around what we talk about. Um, which brings me to my next ex extracurricular. I was the state outreach director for the California Association of Student Councils, which uh, is called CASC. And so what CASC is, is a statewide student council, um, all the way from like Redding, California, up north down to San Diego. And what I did as state outreach director was I led 12 different marketing committees throughout the year and helped them reach out to students, teachers, um, nat statewide organizations. As, uh, and we, what we would do is we would find sponsors who would donate to our, our organization. And our organization is dedicated to helping students be politically and socially active. 
so there's a cal uh, twice a year we go to Sacramento and we write bills and we propose them to the California state gov uh, government and the Board of Education and they often choose to implement our laws. Um, for example, in California, there's a state law that students are allowed to bring phones to their classrooms in case of an emergency. That was a law written by our organization, presented to the state assembly, um, voted on, passed, and signed by the governor. Recently, we had two bills that were also passed by the governor that are really focused on helping student voice. And so these two um, were activities, in my opinion, that showed leadership. Um, and student activism, which is something more unique that you see. Not a lot of states have uh, opportunities like this. Uh, that brings me to my summer activities. Um, over the summer, I volunteered at UCSF Mission Bay Hospital. I was part of um, caring for patients' mental and physical health. I was also an intern and medical assistant at the Tri-City Physical Therapy Center. Um, so that position entailed of me treating different patients who had uh, musculoskeletal damage. I did a lot with cold and heat therapy as well as ultrasound and um, electro electroshock therapy. Um, my other summer activity, I was a research intern at Thoratech Corporation, which is a private corporation in Pleasanton. Um, I helped start a research project really based on coding. Um, Thoratech really deals with devices for people with heart failure, and so I had a research idea. I pitched it to Thoratech, and they took me on as an intern. Um, this is a key, I put this down as a key factor in my admission, um, because when Caltech wanted to send me a nice card, because they don't send us free stuff. MIT sends us like free sunglasses. Caltech doesn't give you anything. Um, but they do write you a cute little card, and they said, oh, like please come and start a new project here at Caltech like you did, and they mentioned Thoratech which is why I say it's a key factor in my admission. Um, another thing that I would say was a key factor is my starting a nonprofit. Um, when Duke wrote me a handwritten letter, they said like, oh, please bring your nonprofit to our university. So those were my summer activities. The next thing, um, what worked for me was I think that I was very well-rounded compared to most applicants. Um, a lot of people who want to pursue STEM are very STEM focused and so they're they're what we think of as like peak students they peak in one subject which is maybe physics or chemistry or biology and there's not much to them and so colleges might see them as very well uh, very one-dimensional as opposed to well-rounded as being able to do many different things um, I also submitted an art portfolio to all colleges which is a big plus at some schools like MIT and Caltech uh, MIT actually releases statistics of how many students do what type of extracurriculars um, when they apply to their school. And so almost 50% almost of all students do music. Almost 40% do robotics, but only about 10 to 20% do art. So when you do music, it's not as unique to the college admissions officers. Almost half their applicants play piano or the violin, whereas only 10 to 20% of students do art. And so MIT is a school that's very lacking in art students. Um, what also worked for me were leadership positions, which was like president, founder, director. And so those big names, um, those top tier leadership positions, really show a lot of initiative and sense of community about you. And you really need leadership when you apply to colleges. They want to see that you're someone who can create change and add to their campus, not just be another student. Um, also, what also worked for me was long-term dedication to activities. So many of the activities that I had committed to, I had been doing for three to four years. And so that shows that you will keep going with something that you do and not just start it and quit it. Um, for example, on, my co on the common application when you apply to colleges, you're only allowed to submit 10 activities. And so even though I had competed in debate for two years, I chose not to put debate because I stopped it after two years. I did it like ninth grade, 10th grade, and then done. That's not, they don't want to see you start and then stop something, they want to see that commitment. So even if you start something sophomore year, junior year, but you stick with it until your college applications and that's something worth putting on. So this is a sample of some of my art portfolios. Um, they're both award-winning pieces. The circular one won first place in the California State Fair and the silver regional key at the Scholastic Art and Writing Competition. Um, these two elephants won first place in 
the California State Fair as well for ages 16 through 18. I competed when I was 16, so I was youngest of the group. Um, and so what I really wanted to show in my art portfolio was creativity and not just skill. Um, when you put some creativity in your art portfolio, it makes you more memorable as opposed to you just submitting like a landscape, a landscape painting or something because anyone can do a landscape if they, have, if they have enough skill. But putting your own creativity and style and meaning behind your work really um, puts you a step above and it makes college admissions remember you as opposed to saying like, oh yeah, she's the girl who did the mountain drawing. Oh, which girl? There were like 50,000 of them, right? You want to do something that's memorable. And so what didn't work for me, um, I think my weaknesses were very much, I didn't have any high awards in STEM. I didn't compete in Intel or Simons um, or have like a high Olympiad award. I did not have a perfect GPA. I had one B plus, which was in chemistry, um, which is a science subject, which is a big weakness, I think, when you're applying to science schools because a lot of students will have like A pluses in um, science subjects, but nevertheless, it didn't stop me from getting into other STEM schools. Um, and I also had less experience in science, technology, engineering, math fields, as opposed to other applicants. I didn't do any summer programs like Cosmos or Simmer, um, but I did do uh, an internship under Thoratech. And so those I think were my big weaknesses. But now I'm going to talk about showing well-roundedness and leadership because I think that those are the factors that really push me through into admission is to not being the typical STEM applicant. Okay, so a passion for science. So if you're interested uh, in learning like biology and chemistry, you definitely want to pursue that. So for example, I was interested in bio and chem, uh, but I didn't really know what to do with it. The thing is with science and academics is you can be the smartest person in the world, but colleges won't know that about you unless you win some type of award. Like you could have straight A's, but a lot of applicants have straight A's. So if you want to show that you have a passion for science, you show it in awards and doing these competitions. Um, also to have a passion for creating new things. Um, it's a different thing to just love science as opposed to love applying science. There's that difference between I want to learn more and I want to use what I learn. Like MIT does put a heavy emphasis on innovation. Every student that I've met there during their campus preview weekend did something cool with science, whether I knew a guy who was a double ECS major. Um, for graduation, when he was decorating his cap, he hooked up an electronic board to it and he programmed different designs so his cap would flash in different colors. And so everyone does something cool with science and you want to be able to have a passion for not just learning more, but also creating new things. Um, and also to choose activities that fit your interests. Um, my parents thought it would be really great if I did AMC because everyone does AMC and they're like, oh, Victoria, like your dad loves math. You love it too, right? And I was like, no, I don't. My dad was like, you do? Let's go to math class. No, that was not something that fit my interest. And even though I did learn like statistics and probability really well, I actually took a class at Springlight. It didn't interest me at all. And I took the AMC and I still don't know what my score is because I didn't care <laughs> enough to pick up my score and look at it. Um, but what I did learn while pursuing this activity was that there's biology Olympiad classes. So that's the only good thing that came out of math class. Um, the next thing is to have an interest in diverse activities. So if uh, my activity list on the common application included art, soccer, student activism, politics, as well as science, and it's um, showing all of that well-roundedness, then to colleges, you seem more personable. You seem like you have different aspects of your personality that they want to learn about, and you don't seem so one-dimensional. Um, another thing is to my advice for showing well roundedness is to pursue all of your interests, whether they are STEM-related or not. So just because you want to major in computer science one day doesn't mean you only have to do things in computer science. You also need to show colleges that you are well-rounded and you can manage your time by doing a lot of different things. Um, diversity in extracurriculars also shows that you have personality and so it shows that uh, maybe you care about your community and that's why you started teaching classes to underprivileged kids. Maybe you really are interested in student activism, that's why you go out and you help students and you join student council, right? So what you do shows who you are to college, to college admissions officers and so you want to do things that show off your personality 
not just only do like computer science internships and oh you're so one dimensional they only like computer science is that all that there is to you you want to add something that makes you um, more personable more memorable okay so the next thing um, when in terms of showing leadership and well-roundedness a lot of it is about exiting the comfort comfort zone so like everyone says oh like choose what you are comfortable with um, but sometimes you really need to be uncomfortable. You need to show that you're willing to take risks in pursuing something. Um, and that's what really pushed me to find leadership positions. I actually wrote an essay about this um, for Stanford and I eventually got into the school and I wrote about how sometimes like I can be comfortable doing only biology for the rest of my life, but how boring would that be? You have to put yourself out there and take risks and colleges really appreciate it when you take risks and you become vulnerable and you do something that maybe is not like the most comfortable thing to you because it really shows who you are as a person that you're able to be very open-minded. Um, and so exiting the comfort zone, what that did for me was that I was a finalist for the student member position to the California State Board of Education. Um, so what that means is that the California State Board of Education has like I think 12 members and one of those members is a California student. and so. Um, they were looking for a new student uh, board member, and so I applied for the position even though I was like, I don't do student council at school, uh, I'm probably not an A, I'm never going to be ASB president, but this is something I'm interested in. And I ended up being a finalist, which is one of 12 students um, statewide, and um, that really made an impact to me. It was also something that I did write about in my essays because by putting yourself out there, colleges see you as someone who's going to add to their community because you're willing to try different things. Um, it also led me to CASC, which is the statewide council. And so if your school has student council, like imagine that student council across the whole state. On state council, there's only uh, less than 20 of us. Um, and also exiting the comfort zone was also I founded my nonprofit because of that if I hadn't decided to take the risk and go through all the work and file paperwork and coordinate with the local homeless shelters like I never would have started this organization and so sometimes when you want to show leadership like being a leader is not easy you have to be willing to take risks and be willing to do something that might make you extremely uncomfortable but do it anyways because you know, it's cool to start, it's cool to do things like this, but colleges also see that leadership and that initiative, and they remember you as someone who will add to their school. Um, the next advice I have uh, is obviously like, yeah, it's great to do all of these things, right? Like, yeah, Victoria, I can go join student council and start a nonprofit, but how will you find these opportunities? Um, the first thing you can do is ask around. You never know what your teachers, um, upperclassmen at your high school, or your friends have heard of and can introduce you to. Um, and also join what you can. You never know what opportunities can lead you to others. So um, for example, I had done one year of student council at my school. I absolutely hated it because all we did was like talk about planning prom, which was not interesting to me. I didn't even go to prom in the end. Um, but joining the student council introduced me to Surfboard E, which was our district-wide um, student board. And joining Surfboard E led me to student activism and then because I joined SURF, I applied for the student board member position on the California State Board of Education. And because I chose to do that, I was able to join CASC and be the marketing and outreach director. And so you never know where you can start off as. Like I really don't have anything to do with student council ever, but I'm really happy where I am on state council because I'm able to um, influence and help so many students who live like 300 miles away from me and I will probably never meet personally but I'm able to help them with like education policy and law at their school. Um, also finding opportunities, be open-minded and proactive and try everything just in the sense that maybe it, it sounds like something like oh maybe I'll like it. If you say maybe you'll like it then try it anyways um, and you never know what you will like theoretically in high school because like when I started off in high school I was like yeah I'm gonna do biology I'm not gonna pay attention to student council and maybe I'll do some art but I don't know if I ever want to teach art because little kids can be very annoying when they're like four or five years old um, but I was really open-minded about everything and in the end I pursued a lot of different activities that I was very happy with and the last thing for finding opportunities is do not forget about volunteering 
Um, the reason being is that volunteering shows a lot of compassion to colleges, and it can also show leadership, compassion. You care about your community, and you're very organized if you're willing to dedicate your time solely to another organization on top of like home <coughs> homework and AP testing and everything like that. So volunteering shows a lot about you. It's like five things in one. Um, but when I say volunteering, I don't mean like, oh, like volunteer to like pick up trash at your school. Like, no, that's not really a good activity unless you're like the number one like leader and you organize these cleanups. Um, what I mean by volunteering is to show something that has like strong community ties, right? It shows that you care about the city that you live in or maybe you, um, Maybe you volunteer to teach music, uh, to teach music at the hospital, or you play music at the retirement center. Something that shows that you really care about your community. Um, the last thing, finding research opportunities. So this is something that is very, very tricky. Um, you can do a lot of summer programs like Cosmos or Simmer, which is um, a Stanford program. Those summer programs are really great ways to introduce you to research. Um, for Cosmos. I've personally never done Cosmos because my brother did it and he did Cosmos at UC San Diego. I have no idea what he did, he did there to like this day. I know he went to the beach, I know he got really tan, and I know he got me like a stuffed animal from the San Diego Zoo. In terms of research, I have no idea what he did there. Uh, but I think Cosmos is definitely a good program to do freshman or sophomore year to kind of get you in introduced to what um, scientific research is like and to give you that experience but I don't think it's something that you should do like it's the summer after junior year and you're like wow I really need to do something this summer for colleges I don't think it's a good idea to like bank on Cosmos um, for Cosmos it's really something that the UC's care about and not so much other private schools um, but there are a lot of good summer programs that you can find um, I actually did apply to many different ones. I got a summer internship with the National Children's um, Pediatric Oncologist Hospital in Ohio. It is the leading um, children's cancer hospital in the world and I was going to go there for a summer program called Mechanisms, do my research, enter it in a competition and write a paper. Um, but in the end I turned it down um, and that summer instead I decided to pursue Floratech, which I think in my opinion was a better idea. Um, another way you can find research opportunities is by emailing professors um, with an idea. This one is typically a lot harder. It's very difficult to obtain. Most of the people who have obtained these things by emailing professors is because that professor is like their mom's best friend's husband or something like that. You know, there's like a personal connection. It's not like you randomly email um, a professor at Stanford. Um, I actually did end up doing that. Um, <laughs> and I, I was lucky enough that the professor said like, hey, I don't have room for you right now, but give me like a few months and you can come and work with me at Stanford. And then I ended up turning it down for Thoratech. Um, the reason being is because like soft, my freshman and sophomore year, I was like so determined. I'm like, mom, dad, I'm going to become a children's cancer doctor. And I'm going to help kids with this disease. And then I slowly realized that it wasn't something I wanted to do. I was more interested in creating new things and like kind of looking at the intersection between computer science and biology, um, which is why I pursued Thoratech. It was um, my, pro I can't give a lot of details about my project, but what it was is um, redesigning a certain medical device by recoding it, um, which I thought was a lot more, which appealed more to me than um, looking at sick kids all day, because that would break my heart a little bit. Um, another thing about research competition, about finding research opportunities, it's very competitive. Whether you choose to email a professor or you choose to do a summer program. And it requires previous academic experience. And I don't mean academic experience like, oh, like I have straight A's in science. Like, do something that's competition wise and earn an award in it and show that you do know what you're talking about um, in terms of science. And also show professors that you are intelligent, you are capable, and you are mature. Um, and also remember to market yourself because like when professors or summer programs want, uh, when you apply to these professors or you apply to these summer programs, like why do they care about you? Why should they take you at all? Like you are a random kid from the Bay Area and there are a lot of random kids in the Bay Area who apply for these programs. So why should they remember you and why should they care about you? Um, for example, when I was applying for 
And it ends up really applying for Thoratec. They really didn't need to redesign that medical device at all. I just decided to email the guy. Um, when I emailed him, I told him like, hey, like I have a really good idea that will make your product seem more appealing to people who need it. Um, the reason being is that Thoratec is a private corporation. Their money is based solely on how much of that product, that medical device that they sell. And so like know who your audience is and market yourself accordingly. Um, also with professors, a lot of professors do have openings for high school interns. Um, it's just that you have to monitor the Stanford pages very closely because Stanford does ha actually have a lot of room for student interns. And so that is on finding research opportunities. Very competitive, but very worthwhile if you're able to carry it through. And also, the last thing, um, besides being well-rounded, is to being a leader. So you need to show colleges that you have initiative, right? Colleges want to take students that add something to their campus, not just like a student who like sits around and eats their dorm food, right? And a key thing about being a leader is that you want to take control and direct, like at school you can start by like directing clubs, running for like president or vice president. And to a lot of colleges, it's the vice president and president position that's important, not so much treasurer and secretary, because if you're secretary, you write notes. If you're treasurer, you do addition and subtraction with money, right? You really want to look at the president, vice president positions because those are the ones where you're leading people and you're pushing your club in a certain direction. Um, and you also, what's also a good idea is starting something new and meaningful, whether it's a club or like you decide to get friends together to volunteer or teach other children. Um, teaching is actually something, volunteering to teach is actually something that, in my opinion, is very worthwhile and means a lot to colleges because it shows so much about you. Like, first of all, you're like patient enough to deal with kids like three, four hours a day and teach them something new, but you love what you're doing enough to want to teach people about it. And teaching children is a lot harder than you think because they have like no attention span when they're like five. Um, but also, one thing that's very important that I noticed throughout my high school year was that you need to be a leader within your school and outside of your school. Um, and I say this because um, the two valedictorians at my school have perfect GPAs. They're involved in many different clubs, French club, science club, science Olympiad, science bowl. Um, they are going to UCLA and UC Berkeley. One of them did not get into any private schools at all. And one girl only got into one private school. And um, well, I personally think the reason that caused that is because they were only involved in clubs at school. Any leadership that they showed was within their school. And when you think about it on a grand scale, your school is like a very, very small community. So when you're going to be a leader, you want to be a leader outside of your community as well, as well whether it's within your town, within your region, your district, your state. Um, and so make sure that you lead within your school and outside of it. Because if you're only constrained within your school, that doesn't show as much leadership the reason being is that every club needs a president so you're like filling that role but not every city decides like oh yeah let's have like high schoolers teach children art right be a leader within your school and outside of it and so this moves us to our next topic where I will uh, so those are tips that you really want to do for US schools but now we're going to talk about the difference between UK and US schools um, so UK schools, they are very academically focused and career oriented. Um, they don't care about your extracurriculars at all unless they're related to your majors. And I say that because when I was writing my personal essay for Oxford, there was a sentence that said, we do not care about your extracurricular activities unless they are related to your major. Um, and so for UK schools, because they're so academically focused, you really want to show them your intelligence through standardized testing, through APs, SAT subject tests, if you have IB, then take your IB tests, and they really want to see that high level of achievement. Um, and the good thing about UK schools it, is that it requires one personal essay, and that essay should really be focused on the passion for your major and not like, oh yeah, like I volunteer to teach art. Like, no, they don't care. I did not even mention that at all. Like, my professor at Oxford has no idea what I do outside of science. I don't think she really cares. She's kind of like, oh, this American girl is nice. Let's accept her. Um, you really want to sound professional. You want to sound logical. And you want to sound dedicated in your essay, um, especially for the UK schools, because they are very career oriented. 
the end goal of a UK school is to get you into the job market very efficiently and have you be able to take those high rank positions. Um, like for instance, at Oxford, um, I was accepted for biochemistry. Their program is three years for a bachelor degree and one year for a master's degree, and they, you can either choose to pursue a PhD after that, or you can just directly go into the job market, because after four years, you have a master's in biochem. And so the UK schools are something that are very academically focused. And all of this, your academics, your personal essay, will only get you past round one of UK admissions. Round two is Oxford Cambridge interviews. And so what that is is that the committee at Oxford or Cambridge, I personally did not apply to Cambridge. I didn't even know I was allowed to apply to Cambridge. Um, typically in the UK, you pick one or the other, and I chose Oxford because it was based on pure sciences as opposed to engineering. Um, and also the application fee was like 12 US dollars, and my mom was like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Everything else in the US is like 85 US dollars. Um, and so what the Oxford interviews are, are 30 to 60 minute long interviews. They are verbal. They are either the professor and a graduate student asking you questions, or the professor will give you a, a, science, a scientific article ahead of time. Uh, you have 30 minutes to read it, answer questions, memorize and understand as much about it as you can, and the next 30 minutes is the professor asking you questions um, about the article. And it's really focused on critical thinking and applying your knowledge, not reciting it. Um, for instance, there, one of our warm-up questions for the interview was a math question. You are given a structure of an E. coli. So I'm probably not supposed to tell you this, but it's, they do different questions every year, I think. Um, an E. coli cell is three-dimensional. They give you two dimensions. They, want, they give you the mass, and they want you to find density. So obviously, like, you know, density is mass over volume. But you can't find the volume because you're missing one dimension. So what you do to find the dimension is you approximate it based on the fact that the, the surface area to volume ratio of an E. coli has to be like ideal. It's like a 4 to 1 or a 6 to 1. And that's like the warm-up question, which was not a warm-up. I had a friend who got that question. And he was like, maybe if I stare long enough at the professor, he, she will realize that I don't know the answer and we'll move on. But no. <laughs> at these interviews, you can take as long as you want with answering the questions because they want to see how quickly and how critically and analytically you can think with these essays. And so the UK schools are very much intelligence and academic based as opposed to US schools, which can be a little random. Uh, your interviews are also what make it or break it for you. So the rumor at Oxford which within all of the applicants, which the professors will never admit to, is that once you finish your interview, the professor and the graduate student will look at each other and they will either say yes or no. And so about two, three minutes after your interview, they will have decided whether they want to accept you or not. Um, when I went there, there was over 30 of us um, at Exeter College in Oxford applying for biochemistry. Only five of us got in. Um, and that's only after the second round. Initially, a lot more people apply. A lot of people get cut out um, because their scores don't make it or their essay isn't good enough or intellectual enough. And then we go to interviews, which is um, pretty stressful, to be honest, the interviews. Um, sometimes the professors are just like, not like scary, but they look like they're just judging you, which is their job, but it's still a little bit unsettling. Um, there's also a huge difference between the UK and the US curriculum, being that um, in AP chemistry over here, there is no more organic chemistry within the curriculum. In the UK, there still is organic chemistry. And so a lot of fellow applicants at Oxford, when they realize I didn't do organic chemistry, they're like, why did you even apply to us? And I was like, why are you so mean? Like, in the end, I got in and that girl who like new organic chemistry didn't. And so it's not, it, it just proves that it's not about your knowledge, it's about how well you can apply it critically. And so that brings us to US schools, which is a lot more different than UK schools. Whereas the UK focuses on your intel, um, intellectualness and your uh, academics, US schools, you basically need to be academically uh, excellent. You want to be well-rounded. You want to be dedicated, and you want to be a student, a volunteer, and a leader, um, which is a lot more than the UK, because if you look back at the UK, it's like, do good on your AP and SATs. Um, the US is definitely more demanding. 
and it can seem very random as opposed to the UK. The reason being is that once you get to schools like MIT, Stanford, uh, or Stanford, um, a lot of the students have a very high GPA. A lot of the students have fives, 2400s, 800s, and you having a bunch of test scores is not going to differentiate you from the other person. Um, it's kind of like in US schools, you need to stand out because the, comp the level of competition at these top schools is very high. Everyone is as smart or smarter than you are and you need to show why you should be admitted over someone who might pretty much be smarter than you. Because I was admitted to Caltech and there was a boy who was a, uh, got the gold medal in the International Physics Olympiad and he didn't get in. And I was like, whew, <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. Not really based on intelligence there, right? Um, as opposed to UK schools where the cutoff for whether you make it or not is how well you think analytically in the interviews the cutoff for U.S. schools often is who you are as a person, or what your extracurriculars <coughs> are, what you've done outside your academics. Which brings us to playing the college lottery. Um, I saw this in an article that students are now applying to 15 or more colleges because it is so random that you don't know where you're going to get into. Um, I know many people who were rejected by Stanford but got into Harvard rejected by MIT but got into Princeton and so with these top schools it can seem very random like yes all of the applicants are extremely intelligent and in the end it becomes about what you have done outside of your <coughs> academics and how much you appeal to that school their campus and their culture and so let's start with college essays they are the most important part of your college application the reason being is that college essays show why you are different from other students and why you should be accepted Okay, like, why should this girl from California be accepted over an interna international physics Olympiad champion, right? Those are what come out in your essays, and those are what show you, like, to college admissions officers, they don't even know what you look like. But these essays kind of help them envision who you are as a person, and help them predict your behavior. How active will Victoria be on campus at MIT? How much will she contribute to us at Stanford, right? And so, <clears throat> my advice for college essays is you want to start early, but before you start early, read a lot of example essays or sample essays and kind of look at that general tone of what those essays are like. And you'll notice that a lot of those kids sound very mature. They talk about maybe a struggle in their life, no matter how big or small and how it changed them. They are creative. They are a little bit funny, but not too offensively funny, right? Um, and so my advice with college essays is to be memorable, but in a good way, whether it's with jokes, it's with puns, it's with a memorable opening line or a memorable closing line, something that gives a college admissions officer any reason to remember you. Um, for example, with my essays for Caltech, I talked about competing with my mom to take control of our oven. I was running a science experiment and she was cooking food. I was like, mom, like my science experiment is more important than you feeding our family. She's like, no, it's not. I'm like, yes, it is, mom. And like, we would fight over it. That's what I wrote an essay about. It's something more memorable than like, I have done four years of blah, 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 Olympiad, right? It's something that you want to be memorable and show who you are. Um, the next slide I have, appealing to STEM schools. So if you are not a top STEM student, like an Intel winner or um, an Olympiad finalist, you want to show why the school needs you. You don't want to try to be the typical STEM applicant which means like you don't want to try to compete with students who you are not, you basically are not them, right? Like I knew I was never, I was not going to make um, the National Bi Biology Olympiad and go to camp. And I knew that it would be very hard for me to compete with those students and say like, oh yes, I am just as good and as dedicated as them to, as them to science, right? Like academic excellence and academic extracurriculars are necessary. You want to have those like as like a starting point. But what you should also do to appeal to these STEM schools is to be the different STEM applicant. You want to appeal to these schools' needs for diversity, right? So like that typical myth about MIT, Caltech, Stanford is like, oh yes, the Intel winners get in, the Simons winners get in, the people who win these Olympiads are the students who get in. But there aren't enough of those winners to populate a school, right? And so you have to realize like, who are the people who get in then? These schools need diversity, right? MIT, Caltech, they need campus diversity outside of their science-focused culture. I can tell you that 
pretty much everyone I met at MIT at, knows is fluent in like English, like Spanish, French, Chinese, something like that, and then like Java or like C++, right? That's like a common factor within students. And what you want to do is show something that is uncommon, something that tells them like, hey, I will make your campus more, ex more exciting than just some place that is only about science, right? If you look at Caltech, the only majors they have are like engineering, science, math, at MIT, there is literature and theater arts, but who goes to MIT for literature and theater arts? Those majors are there for students to double major, not like you apply to MIT for literature. Why would you do that? You should go to like Yale or something, not MIT. That's not the right place. Um, and because these schools are known for science, a lot of the students who end up applying are the typical STEM students. They are kids who peak in science as opposed to being well-rounded. And so what you want to show them is, hey, I can add diversity to your school. I can make sure that your school is not stereotyped as the nerdy school where everyone wears glasses and is socially awkward. No, you want to show them like, hey, I can help make your school a better place by adding that diversity. And I knew that, I knew that when I applied to Caltech. Because I was like, the people who apply to Caltech, Caltech is a school where if you want to do like aerospace engineering, um, chemical engineering. Um, I think two of like China's most favorite, famous um, professor scientists. One who created like a nuclear bomb or something, and one who was really big in aeronautics and missiles went to Caltech. And so Caltech is very science focused. And I knew that no matter what I did, my STEM my STEM achievements would never be equivalent to those people's. And so what I did was I took the alternative route. I wrote essays on soccer, on art, on volunteering and how I connected those activities with science to really show that, hey, science is a universal theme in my life as well as everything that I do. And the reason that appealed to Caltech is because, first of all, there's not a lot of, you don't see a lot of science students who do an Olympiad, um, a sport, do art and volunteering. A lot of people who want to go to MIT typically focus only on the science aspect of their life. Um, which isn't a bad thing. If you can do that and be like an international Olympiad champ champion, then like go ahead. But it's very, very difficult and not everyone can make it, which is why I decided to go to this route. You want to show passion for applying science and being creative and innovative. So not just knowing a lot, but knowing what to do with what you learn and creating new things. Um, the reason I say that Florida Tech was a key part of my admission, um, not just because Cal like when Caltech wrote it on their letter for me, so when colleges write letters to you, they typically write about what they think was most memorable or most important about you. And when they wrote about Floritech, I knew that they liked the idea of me creating something new for this medical company and using that innovation because colleges want to have students who graduate from their school and make some huge impact to the world because they can brag and say like, hey, that's my student. The same way your mom and dad are like, the same way my dad like sticks a Stanford sticker on the car and goes, that's my daughter. Like colleges want to have that sense of pride as well. And so you want to show them that you are a leader, you are creative, you are innovative, and you are different from other people who apply to their schools. And so I think that being a different STEM applicant is really what pushed me over in these schools. Um, appealing to STEM schools. So almost every applicant is knowledgeable and intelligent. Within a high level of competition, pretty much everyone is gonna have the same test scores and awards unless you're like a legacy student or something, and like your parent went to MIT or Stanford. Um, but you also want to show you are intellectual and creative through internships, through activities, through essays, and not just someone who's very flat and can like, oh, like yeah, you can learn a lot of things, and that's great, you learn a lot, but what do you do with what you learn? You need to apply it, you need to do something with it to show that you actually understand what you're doing. Because like, doing really well on an AP test, like, okay, cool, you understand the material, but what are you gonna do with it? Are you gonna be boring and just remember it for the rest of your life, or are you gonna go out and do something? And showing that innovation and leadership is really what colleges want to see um, in their students. And do not be one-dimensional. Um, being the atypical STEM advocate means being involved in a lot of different things and being more than just a scientist or an engineer. Um, like I can tell you, outside of the crazy students at MIT or like the geniuses at MIT, um, the people who seemed, you know, like relatively normal, you know, they were like writers, they were editor-in-chief of their school newspapers, um, they were super athletic track runners, 
they did really well in art competitions. They submitted a portfolio, something that made them stand out from other students who applied for science, that made them more memorable and made them really unique because like, yeah, MIT, if they accept you, like obviously you're good at science. MIT is one of the top tech schools in the nation, if not the world. But they also, by being, one, by being more than just one dimensional, by showing different aspects of your personality, you're not only more memorable, the college admissions officers will remember you more as a person. Like, oh yeah, like that's the applicant who is really compassionate and cares about her community because she has so much volunteering. Or like, that's the applicant who works super hard and organizes their time well because they play or they run track at a very high level. Um, one of my classmates at MIT was a national track runner. She competed in like the Junior Olympics or something. And so while she wasn't the smartest STEM student there, she was very, very athletic. Or uh, there was another uh, male student who got in. Um, he was, I think, a national ice skating champion. And so that really puts you one above everyone else who is good at science. And it makes you more memorable. And it makes the college want you because you can add something different to their campus. So basically, in a pool of thousands of applicants, you need to stand out. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is family support, is what your parents can help you do besides like, you know, like drive you around and feed you and give you money. So what your family can do, encouragement and motivation is a huge part. Um, it's really easy in like sophomore year or junior year to hit like a slump where you're like, oh my god, I don't want to do this anymore. I have to do this for two, three more years of like a lot of APs and things like that. Um, and so what parents can do is really keep you focused on your priorities and reminding you of what needs to be done, as well as helping you be more confident and helping you aim high. Um, when I initially entered the college application process, I was like, mom, this is so random. Like, I don't even think I can get into Davis at this point. Like, what am I going to do? And my mom was like, you can at least get into Berkeley. I was like, mom, I don't know. <laughs> and then I was like, I'm just going to apply to um, three more UCs instead of Berkeley. And my mom was like, why are you wasting my money? I was like, it's better to be like safe than sorry, right? But what parents really remind you is to help you be confident in what you're doing and kind of remind you like, hey, what you're doing is worthwhile. You're good at it. Um, or as my mom would tell me, you're decently good at it, so keep going to move higher, right? Push you to aim high. That's what a lot of parents can do. Um, <clears throat> because there are times in high school where you're very exhausted and it's like 2 a.m. and you just turned in your English paper because the deadline was midnight um, online and you realize you have other things to do for activities. Like I can't tell you how many nights there were that I had just finished all of my, I had gone to school. So what my daily schedule had looked like was I would go to school eight to three, three to five I would have soccer practice for our school varsity team. From five to six I would drive, make the drive to Saratoga to go to math class from 6.30 to nine. I would get home around 9.30, 9.40. I would start my schoolwork. When I was done with my schoolwork, I had to make curriculums for nonprofit organizations. I had to make marketing materials for CAS. And so there are a lot of times where you, you're just tired, but parents are really there to remind you, like, hey, keep going. You've been doing it for so long that you are capable of doing this, and you can keep going. Um, another thing that family can do is support you with your ideas, but also make suggestions if you go a little too crazy, you know, or if you're not being realistic enough. Parents are really good to help you be there and kind of remind you of what's plausible and what's not. Um, and they can also help you find new extracurriculars, whether it's sports, competitions, leadership activities, um, especially with sports, because my dad thought it would be great if I played basketball because I was tall for like a seven-year-old. But what he didn't know was that the basketball league is, is ages seven to nine. So even though I was tall for a seven-year-old, I was like really short for a nine-year-old. And so like he had me try out basketball, which was horrible. But my dad also really had me join soccer, which I first hated because I thought it was too much running. I was really fat when I was a kid. Sports were not my thing. But my parents really encouraged me to keep going. And I've been playing soccer for almost 10 years now. And I will be continuing to play in school as uh, on the club team. And so when parents help you find new extracurriculars, they do it like out of the goodness of their hearts. Like when my dad had me start math, I was like, this is gonna be horrible. But by doing the statistics and probability class, like school was definitely a lot easier. Um, the other thing is that often your parents know you better than you, than you know yourself because you know they're with you every day. They know all of your habits. 
and they kind of know how you think. And, like, you don't want to admit that because, like, sometimes my mom will say exactly what I'm thinking. And I'm like, Mom, no, you're totally wrong. She's <laughs> totally right. But she's never going to know that, right? But your parents know you better than you know yourself. So when they make suggestions for you, whether it's with activities or how to write like your college essays, like be open to them and listen to them as well um, because parents can give really helpful advice. Um, another thing parents can do is keep you accountable, organized, and realistic. So like there are times obviously when like in the middle of high school you kind of want to relax and maybe like watch TV or sleep or something like that. And what parents do is really remind you of how much work you have and make you really think about like, how realistic is it that I go out and watch a movie with my friends? How realistic is it that I just do nothing for three hours? Because it's really tempting to just sleep or nap for three hours. Um, but parents really remind you to be on top of what you're doing. And so, um, as personally, as someone who has so many different extracurriculars to go to, um, my parents really helped me keep organized which with what I was doing. Half because they had to drive me to these activities for two years. When I got my license junior year, they were free. Um, but besides that, when they had to drive me, I would kind of like tell them like, hey, I have to be here at 6.30, here at eight, and uh, a Friday we all have to sleep early because I have an eight o'clock game in Concord for soccer, right? And so parents do help you keep organized very much. And something that's very important because it's really easy to load up on too many activities or too many AP classes and just totally um, not be able to handle them all. The parents do a really good job of helping you handle things. Um, another thing that I think is really important to talk about is balancing independence and family support. And to me what that means is that when you as a student are becoming a leader and you're becoming more mature, there are a lot of things that you just want to do by yourself and that you kind of have to do by yourself. Um, like for example, when I was um, organizing classes with um, the local homeless shelter, like I can't go into an interview with the homeless shelter with my mom right behind me. Why? Because it doesn't make you look mature. It doesn't make you look like a teacher who's capable of being with kids for a few hours if you still have to bring your parent to an interview with you. And so there are some things that students have to do by themselves and that you need to do in order to be mature and grow up and show to colleges that you are a leader. It's just something that has to happen naturally. Um, but at the same time, what's important about family uh, with my mom and dad is that they supported me in all of my activities they drove me everywhere until I could drive myself. They were always like, oh yeah, Victoria, like, how is everything going? They would like check in with me, like, how is CASC? How are these art classes? What are the kids like? Um, but the good thing with family is that they're able to help you when you need help, when you can't do something by yourself. Like, there are times in high school where you simply just can't do everything by yourself, and parents are really knowledgeable of stepping in and my parents, they always allowed me to do what I could by myself. I would write emails for internships, for, um, for to like the library, um, marketing emails for CASC. I would write them all by myself. But when my parents realized that there was maybe something I couldn't do without them, they would help me. And so that's really important, but it's also a very fine line between like being independent and knowing when you need help because it's really easy to be prideful and be like, no mom, I can do this by myself. Like, I'm a 15 year old adult, which to your parent who's like been through life is like, you're ridiculous, like a 15 year old adult. But it's a really fine line between like letting your child grow up and mature and recognizing that they can do certain things by yourself, but also knowing when to help um, your kid out with maybe things that they do need adult support for. So uh, my final results and thoughts, which is basically my idea of the college lottery and uh, my acceptances. So my college results, I was accepted to Oxford, Stanford, MIT, Caltech, Harvey Mudd College with um, a $40,000 merit scholarship, which my mom was really excited about because it was $40,000. The total yearly cost at Harvey Mudd is like 70,000, I wanna say. Tuition is like 70,000. So with 40,000, it was like the equivalent of attending Berkeley. But Harvey Mudd is a very good science school. The only majors that they have are science and math. Um, it is a private liberal arts college down in Claremont in South Southern California. And um, lately, Forbes magazine, I think, did a um, analysis of which colleges have the richest students, basically like which colleges, their graduates have the highest paying jobs. The first school was MIT. Then Caltech, 
and then Harvey Mudd and Stanford tied, I believe. And so Harvey Mudd is a very good option for STEM. It's also pretty difficult to get into. Um, I also got into Duke, Johns Hopkins for pre-med, the University of Pennsylvania. I got into UC Berkeley as a region scholar and UCLA as the region scholar. My mom was so excited when I got into UC Berkeley as a region scholar because when I was younger, she was like, Victoria, my dream for you is to go to Stanford. I don't think you're smart enough. So UC <laughs> Berkeley with regions is like, you know, that's pretty ideal. And then I ended up getting into Stanford. So my mom's been very happy. She's like, you made my dreams come true. And I was like, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> this is really like, you're not going to college, mom. I am, but she's happy. Um, I was rejected by Princeton and Yale, but I was waitlisted by Harvard. Um, a big thing to know, I think I was waitlisted by Harvard mainly because of my extracurricular activities. Um, I had applied to Harvard for biology, which is one of their more competitive majors. They have a really good biology program because their medical school is so good. Um, but I think at what Harvard really likes to see, um, I think at least personally, was a lot of like volunteering and community work, which I had a lot of. And then my final thoughts, being well-rounded will set you apart from STEM app, from other STEM applicants. Like, to be very honest, I don't think that I'm as smart as the guy who got in and got the gold medal in the International Physics Olympiad. But I do think that by showing that I have a lot of different sides to me with like sports, volunteering, and how, you per how I pursued other interests and made science still part of all of them really appeal to colleges. Because in college, it's not just about learning a lot, but it's also about contributing to the campus and being an active part of campus. And that's what a lot of schools want to see. Um, and like, it's, like I said, it satisfies their need for diversity. Like how boring would MIT or Caltech be if like all of their students only did science and there was like no sports teams, no volunteering teams, nothing like that, right? When um, people tell me that like, oh, like Victoria got into MIT because she's a girl and they need girls. Would you want to go to MIT if it was 95% boys and 5% girls? And the guy who said that to me was like, that's true, I wouldn't want to go to MIT. No one would want to go to MIT. And so schools need diversity. And what you want to do to get into these top STEM schools is really fill that need for diversity. Um, and what I think helped me the most was a consistent theme of like creativity throughout my application, um, particularly with the work I did at Florida Tech within my art portfolio and how I wrote my essays. Um, I don't have like my essays on for display, but throughout my essays I wanted, at least like for Caltech, I wanted to show how science is a part of everything I do in art, how it's a part of everything I do in soccer. Like um, I wrote an essay connecting soccer and physics. I wrote an essay connecting art and chemistry. Um, and so those are things that you want to talk about that make you more memorable and also being able to integrate science in every part of your life, that's not something a lot of people can do. It's like one thing to take tests all day and compete really well. It's another thing to show that you live and breathe science in everything you do. And I think that's something that I showed through my well-roundedness that really appealed to these schools. And so uh, another thing is uh, throughout high school is to be very uncomfortable and pursue your interests because taking these risks and going out and putting yourself out there help you grow as a person. And they don't just make a great essay topic, but they also, like colleges will be able to see that. And uh, they'll be able to see like, oh yeah, like you can do science and you are a good person, right? Um, definitely take leadership roles. Don't be afraid to take responsibility. If you are capable of going out and running a club, if you are capable of organizing volunteer groups, then go out and do it because it's something worthwhile. Um, another thing is that family support is very helpful to you because having a lot of extracurricular activities is almost the norm for colleges now. And your parents are your number one fans. They'll help you in everything you do because they only want to help you and they only want the best for you. Like apparently my parents' way of showing love is like we're going to support Victoria and help her reach the college of her dreams, which is really nice, you know? My other friend's parents are like, hey, we'll buy you makeup for your birthday. But my parents are like, we'll drive you to soccer which is actually, um, I think, is something very meaningful for your parents to basically take time out of their lives and dedicate it to you and really say, like, hey, I'm going to put my activities on hold and help you out. Because my mom could have, like, read a lot of, done a lot of things that she enjoys, like reading or, like, traveling, but she chose to put those things on hold to help me out and, like, throughout college. 
and so did my dad. Sometimes my dad thinks that I forget about him, but like, you know, dad's a great team. Um, but thank you for coming and listening, and are there any questions? Can you like show me the first few slides? Oh, yeah. about me overview on um, like my academics and extracurriculars. Oh, um, about, so going in more into detail about my academics, um, my freshman year I took all honors, sophomore year I took three APs and all honors, junior year I took six APs and self-study two, senior year I took it easier, I took four APs, studio art, and then a college class which my counselor at high school did not think was taking it easy. I told her that, and she was like, that's not taking it easy. And I was like, okay, well, it's easier than it was junior. Can you repeat that again? Um, so <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, freshman year, I took all honors. Sophomore year, I took three APs in all honors. Um, <clears throat> junior year, I took six APs in self-study two. Senior year, I took four. I did studio art, which was our school's version of AP art, but we um, legally weren't allowed to call it AP art. And I took um, community class college, uh, community college classes for math, um, because my school doesn't, it only goes up to calculus BC and AP statistics. Um, I think going to community college math was also something that differentiated me from a lot of applicants. The reason being is that a lot of students who do take higher level maths, like multivariable, or differential equations or something like that is because their schools have it like they, their schools have like a program with community colleges and the community college will teach it on campus for them um, but I took the initiative to go out to a community college and go to it every night and take that commitment and it really shows that you are interested in learning that math and you're committed to it and you're able to organize your time really well um, it was actually something that my high school counselor talked a lot about in her recommendation for me I think um, because Is she was that a private school or or public high school. Oh, I go to public high school. We are a very not well known public high school. Um, the reason being is um, almost half of our senior class goes to community colleges, um, and then the rest is split between um, like state colleges, UCs. Not a lot of kids go to privates from our school, and so we don't. We aren't like a very competitive school like Lindbrook or Monta Vista and so um, at my school you basically have to be very self-motivated if you want to go to a top school um, the reason being is that because like our teachers tend to have lower standards in my opinion um, our vice principal wanted to talk to me because he said taking two APs is enough why do you want to take six um, and so the teachers don't like when our teachers give college talks to us they talk about how to get into state universities, community college, and UCs. And so at our school, if you want to get into a private, you got to do it yourself. And you have to be motivated enough to do it yourself. Yeah. Um, the next few slides is extracurriculars. Uh, you, you mentioned a lot about uh, MIT, and, but you got into a Stanford and you take Stanford. Yeah. What are the differences in terms of application? Um, so in terms of the application, so Stanford has four essays, they have the common application essay, um, one about what you would tell your roommate, which is that essay is geared heavily to showing your personality, one about what is important to you, and one about intellectual vitality. So for what is important to you, like I had a friend who applied to Stanford and he said, time is important to me. And I was like, that's kind of boring. Like time is important to everyone. Um, but like what's important to you is because it's such an open-ended question, the prompt is literally like, what matters to you and why? And so that is what they really see who you are because it's how you interpret the question. And so um, for that essay, I wrote about vulnerability. I wrote about um, my ability to take risks and be okay with the fact that, yeah, I'm gonna probably fail at something, but I'll try it anyways. Um, the second essay was like, what is your intellectual vitality? I wrote an essay about it. I still have no idea what intellectual vitality means, to be completely honest, um, because it's a term that you don't really hear a lot. But what I interpret it as, like Stanford's questions are very open-ended because they want to see how you interpret them. And so what I took intellectual vitality as is like what makes you like tick as a person or like what really stimulates you. And so I wrote about an art piece that I had done. Um, I took a copper sheet 
and I painted on it with different chemicals like nitric acid, um, chlorides, ammonia, and I would bake it in the oven. That's the science experiment I fought with my mom over. And I wrote about that as intellectual vitality, as like connecting science with other different things and creating something new out of it. Um, it was one of the essays where I knew that I wasn't a top STEM student. And so I wanted to show how I integrate science throughout my life. And so that's what I took intellectual vitality as. The what would you, like the note to your roommate essay, it didn't talk about anything academic, just talked about my personality. Um, I'm not really sure how important that essay is, just because it's very open-ended, but it's definitely something where you don't want to write too academically about, in my opinion, um, because if you show that you're only an academic person, like Stanford is known for being like a quirky school with like its own different kind of culture, and so for the note for roommate, you definitely want to show who you are as a person and like your personality. Um, for MIT, there were a series of like five or six short essays. Um, one about your race uh, and your culture, one about um, like what you do for fun. I wrote about soccer for that one because there are not a lot of athletes at MIT. Um, I also wrote about volunteering. I wrote about um, CASC, which is the work I do um, with student activism. I wrote about Thoratech. And so I really tried to show a lot of dimensions to my personality within them and not just be like, I have every essay about science because that's one, um, too repetitive. It makes you seem like you're a very one dimensional person and there's not much to your personality. But it's also really boring for a college um, admissions reader to kind of go through because if you imagine that there's like six essays per applicant and thousands of students apply to MIT, they want to read something that's different and refreshing and memorable or funny in some sort of way. And that's what I really wanted to aim for with my essays. Um, which I think did pay off. Um, obviously, you do, you're doing a lot. You've done a lot of things. How do you can you share how you manage your life uh, time? Are you gonna just do like 12 hours every day or you know, 18 hours every day? That's number one question. Number two, um, how? <laughs> sorry, I have three questions. Um, how how helpful you think for or have you involved in the mystery like spring light or? similar institution and uh, how helpful you think that it, it, it helps you to get to your, where, where you are on this stage. And third question is, um, <laughs> what makes you think to apply a UK school? Okay, yeah. um, so for the first question, hmm. I did a lot of things mostly by kind of spreading them out throughout the week. Also because um, school homework was never challenging, not too challenging to me. Um, the reason, mm, well, like at school, at my school at least, a lot of it is self-motivated. And so the teachers basically teach you nothing. Like I think I went a whole year of sophomore class sleeping in every math class because my teacher wouldn't do anything, right? But I would learn math in my own time or I would do things, other things in her class besides listen to her because she didn't talk about anything. Um, but honestly with managing a lot of activities is to spread them out throughout the week. So I knew like, okay, I have soccer practice Tuesday, Thursdays, games on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, CASC, um, which is the political um, association I joined, that's something that I do in my own time. And so that was very flexible for me. Um, the time commitment I made to CASC was 10 hours of work for it per week, um, doing emails to organizations, um, making calls, finding sponsors and things like that. Those 10 hours for me were very flexible. Art was also very flexible for me because you kind of work at your own pace. But all the organizations that I did was really about like putting those activities kind of above my schoolwork. For me, school was something that I was capable of staying up late and doing because you can you manage your own time with studying and you manage your own time with homework. Get what you can do um, done ahead of time if it's on the weekends. Um, for soccer tournaments, I would bring my schoolwork with me. And between games, you would have like a game at 8 a.m. Okay, you wake up at five, you drive there, you start warming up at seven, you play from eight to 10. Your next game is at two. So what I would do is I, was, I would nap, I would eat, and then I would do some homework. And so it's really about working efficiently, first of all, and not procrastinating on things, like being able to look at your math homework and saying like, okay, this is gonna take me an hour maximum and getting it done, not just quickly, but very thoroughly and correctly, obviously, because you want to do it wrong. Um, but it's also about <clears throat> being able to fit things in 
and look at time slots and never waste any of your time. Uh, the second question for Springlight to me was very helpful. Um, the reason being is because I knew that I liked biology and I knew I wanted to do something in, with it, but I didn't know what. Um, my school had never had biology Olympiad. It, biology Olympiad had been around for like 10 years and we had never done one round. Um, and I actually jumped to AP Biology my sophomore year and I was like, hey, teacher, we should do the biology Olympiad. He's like, what's that? I was like, it's this really cool competition, let's try it. I was like, and he liked me enough because I was the only sophomore in his class that I had one of the highest grades. And so um, he like agreed to do it and he was super nice too. Um, uh, and Springlight really helped me study for it because if you've ever taken the, any Olympiad at all, you know that an AP class is not going to cut it in terms of material. Um, none of your honors classes are even good enough to like get like three questions right on the biology Olympiad. And so Springlight really helped me go a step above AP curriculum and learn what was necessary to succeed at the Olympiad. And that's why my first year I was able to place in the top 60. I have to be really grateful to Sherry for because that was something that did make me competitive in STEM and did make did show that like hey I'm capable of doing really good things in STEM but I also dedicated my time to other things besides science um, and so I think that these classes really helped me out um, especially because um, the open exam which is like the exam that everyone can take for biology Olympiad when my biology teacher saw it he's like this is what you signed up our school for I was like yeah it'll be fun like, no one qualified from our school except for me because I had done these classes and learned from Springlight. Um, the third question, what made me apply to the UK school was that, um, first of all, Oxford has a very good biology pure science program uh, because they are really focused on pure sciences. Um, another thing that really pushed me to apply to UK schools was um, they do not, like, there is no... Um, they're only based on your intelligence and they want to see how much you are able to learn. And so I applied to Oxford um, thinking I wanted to do biochemistry uh, because it was what I was interested in. It's a very good start for research. But the other good thing about the UK schools is that it's three years for a bachelor, one year for a master. So I would have matriculated at Oxford. I would get my bachelor's degree after three years. Uh, my senior year, I would work on a thesis for my master's degree. And Oxford also had an exchange program in, with Princeton, which I was very interested in, which um, a lot of my teachers at school thought was weird. They were like, you're gonna go to a school and then do a foreign exchange program to go back to your home country. I was like, yes, and they're like, that's dumb. Why don't you just go to an American school? Um, but the thing with English schools is that they're very focused on intelligence and academics, and they're not as random. You know, if you're smart and you do well in interviews, you'll make it. And to me, that was something that was more honest as opposed to like, oh my God, I need to volunteer and be a leader and I need to write really good essays and then maybe I'll have like a 10% chance of going to Stanford, right? Um, and also the application fee was like 12 US dollars. And my mom was like, you know what, like go for it. I'm only gonna lose $12. Because she didn't think I was going to get in. She's like, I doubt Victoria's gonna get into Oxford. Like it's Oxford. And then I got an email for an interview and she's like, ooh. She actually made it. <laughs> yeah, so that was definitely. How much is the air ticket? Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 The thing about Oxford is that um, for the interviews, you do have the option of a Skype interview, but it's not guaranteed that they'll interview you via Skype. And the interviews are what make or break you. So I was like, Mom, Dad, let's let's fly to England. And my mom was like, No, I'm staying home. So my dad went to England with me, um, and it was really beautiful at Oxford. It's definitely a great campus. Um, and what I liked most about their biochemistry program was that um, even though a lot of the majority of the campus was built in like 12,000, um, but the biochemistry department is a brand new building, so it's a very high tech lab, and so they did put a lot of resources into biochem. I could also get my master's, which was nice, but I ended up um, turning down Oxford, which made me very sad. And the person who I was corresponding with with email was very sad um, <laughs> because like out of there were only, um, so Oxford is split up into colleges. There are like 20 or 30 colleges and you pick a college to apply to. Um, I picked Exeter. It was one of the oldest colleges. Their biochem program was focused on like proteins and things that, like that that I wanted to do. It was also a two minute walk away from a coffee shop and I was like, I'm gonna be making that walk a lot if I go to this school. It's a very good location. Um, so each school, um, 
total of biochemistry majors, there are less than 100. Um, and within Exeter, there are only five. And like four of the five were like Oxford, like English students, and I was like the only American. It was actually really fun being there. Um, but I really did like the education system that they have there. Um, it's a very good emphasis on learning pure sciences. I had a friend at MIT. I was originally choosing, um, I was like considering like MIT and Oxford as well. And my friend at MIT was like, oh, if I had known about Oxford's pure science program, I would rather have done that. Um, the reason being is that MIT is very geared towards engineering. There's not a lot of pure sciences there. Um, but it is a great school to go to. If you want to do like chemical engineering or computer science or mechanical engineering, I definitely recommend applying to MIT. They are the top in that. Um, but uh, what made me choose Stanford over MIT was that um, Stanford has a better biology program because of Stanford Medical School. Um, within my major, I'm allowed to take classes at their medical school, um, which apparently when I was visiting made a lot of students think I was an actual Stanford student. Um, but also the major that I got into for Stanford is basically a double major between biology and computer science. And MIT has a similar major, it's called um, molecular biology and computer science, but at MIT it's a very new major. It's not developed that well compared to what Stanford has developed. And especially because I personally feel that MIT's biology curriculum is not as strong as their other science and engineering curriculums. Um, within Stanford, I have resources with the School of Engineering, the Medical School, and um, Computer Science as well. Um, I looked through the course requirements um, for Stanford and MIT. Stanford definitely goes into a lot more depth. Um, I don't have as much experience in computer science, so I had my dad look through the computer science curriculum, and he was like, yes, Stanford does a lot of good classes, like on algorithms, on different systems, and databases. Um, but what I also liked about Stanford is that for my major, they've developed four different tracks. You can choose to do informatics, simulation, cellular and molecular biology, or organ and organ systems. And so they've developed the major very well into four different ways for you to approach this field. And every person gets their own advisor. Um, and the best thing is that not a lot of people are in this major because not as, not as many people want to make the time commitment for this major. Um, the course requirements are that you go to biology classes, you go to computer science classes, you go to engineering classes, and then you go to biology, computer science, engineering joint classes, and you kind of integrate the three. And so there's a lot of individual attention for that major. So you mentioned uh, there's only in my students in, the, in this major? So there are, in the four years of Stanford students, there are currently eight. Um, I think one of my friend's friends just committed, so there's nine. And when I commit to this major and declare, I think I'll be number 10. Um, this major has been around for about 13 years now. Only 50 people have graduated from it and chosen to pursue it because it is a very big time commitment. Um, you hear about a lot of students who like double major or like major and minor. Um, Stanford specifically wrote down in the course for this major, like you probably won't have time to minor. Like if you can do it, like good for you, you're great at time management. But this major is a huge commitment. Um, and it's one of their interdisciplinary programs. And so the major gives you enough room that if you want to go to graduate school for biology, whether it's a, to, to medical school or to pursue a PhD, you can do it. If you want to go to graduate school for computer science, you can do it. Like I always joke with my dad, like, hey dad, maybe I'll go to the school that like you did your computer science degree. He's like, no, you won't. And I was like, yeah, I probably won't. But, you know, it's, it's nice if I did. I didn't have the option to do that. So this major gives you a lot of options. So did you, did you study uh, uh, those 50 people who graduate? What are they doing in the first day? That I don't know. They didn't really put that information up at Stanford. A lot of the students do choose to go to medical school or get their PhD. Um, personally, I want to like do this uh, major and then go to like an MD, PhD, joint program and then work at a company like Genentech. Yeah. Yeah, so, after your uh, college of education, did you hear the outside competitive? Uh, I did have someone help me edit essays, um, which I thought was helpful. They really like sharpen up the language. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, like, 
um, if your editor is like a little older, they might not understand your jokes. And so, it's, <laughs> but then you have to make the judgment like, is this funny to an adult? Or what, or might it come off as immature? So that's the helpful thing with editors sometimes. Like, um, when you read your essay and you're like 17, you're like, wow, this is hilarious. But maybe to like the 20 to 35 year old like college admissions officer, like, wow, this is the most immature thing I've ever read. So it is helpful to have an editor. Your hair is added a note from the, uh, the concept specialist for the. Um, I think a college counselor. I did have a college counselor help me, um, and I think they are very helpful as long as they know you well and will commit time to you. A lot of college college counselors tend to have like a lot of students, and so sometimes you might be placed a lower priority. But it really depends on like will your counselor get to know you and how much time. I had a question about like the your art um, mm -hmm. program that like the nonprofit like like did you start it with a friend or like and also um, for your curriculums like I know you've done art for a really long time so did you kind of use that knowledge to like inspire the people or like how did you kind of go on creating that? Um, so my friend and I we co-founded it. We kind of did equal parts of the work. She, um, she did a lot of the paperwork filing because I hate paperwork. I did more of like the teaching and the curriculum side with students as well as like organizing the stuff. So we co-founded it together. Um, and in terms of curriculum, like uh, the audience that we had for the art classes, they would vary from ages like three or four to 12. And so when you design a curriculum, because there are only two of us or sometimes only one of us would go to classes at a time, Having a student teacher ratio of like 1 to 20 is like pretty bad, especially when the 20 students are very young. And so um, I started off designing curriculums that, that students of all ages could do um, if they follow directions, which sometimes they didn't. But you know, as a teacher, you do have to deal with that. And kind of um, just taking um, like a common denominator and having them all learn it because different kids take things um, differently from art. But I also gave them a lot of freedom to let them color things whatever color they wanted or design something whatever they wanted. Like I didn't ever told them like, oh yeah, color this apple red. Like I had a student who made it purple. If you want to make it purple, like go ahead, it's your artwork. And so to make it more open-ended. And when it's more open-ended, like kids tend to have more fun with it and be more creative. When it's a lot stricter, they don't really want to listen or they think it's like too limiting. And like art is all about like freedom of expression. What are some good like online resources for like sample essays or those kind of things? Um, a lot of times you can pretty much like Google like oh like sample Stanford essays or something, mm -hmm. which was definitely something I did when I saw the prompt like intellectual vitality. Still don't know what it is. Uh, also, uh, a lot of the times you do find it on Google. Sometimes you can ask friends who have been admitted to see their essays. And typically when you ask a friend, they're like totally okay with it as long as you don't like publish it out there somewhere, right? And so uh, for me, a good resource was Googling it and then reading the essays that I enjoyed and thought had a good like tone of voice. Um, and also reading maybe some um, successful essay from friends. Uh, I was very rushed with my Stanford application because I didn't know that there was a different deadline if you were going to submit an art portfolio. Typically regular action deadline is January 1st. If you're submitting an art portfolio, you need to submit your application December 1st. Um, and I realized that like two days before Thanksgiving, I was like, oh crap, I haven't started anything. Um, so I did read a lot of sample essays. And those are helpful for you to see the tone of the essays, but also help you think of different ideas of what to write about. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about the Stanford website has some intern for high school students. Do you know the website? Um, I don't know like the exact link, but what it is is that there are certain labs that professors had. So um, one of my friends got an internship with a lab at Stanford. I think it was like the Kruger lab. I'm not completely sure on that. Um, but there are different labs that basically post what is basically like a help wanted sign. They well, open up applications. So only post on their lab website? Yeah, on their lab website. So you really have to monitor those lab websites and you basically are going to open a lot of tabs off of Google and looking at their websites. Okay. Yeah, which school uh, you applied in the early? Um, I applied to Princeton early. Oh. I was originally deferred and then rejected. Yeah. And the 
for that opportunity, you found for the student member position to Scandinavia State the Board of Education. How do you find that type of uh, like a? Um, so I came from um, the organization that I joined, Serve Board U, which is um, a student um, board to our district board of education. Um, and our district board was like, hey, the state is also looking for a new board, a student board member. And major no one else applied from the committee except for me um, because I was willing to put myself out there. But um, it basically came from what I talked about, like you never know what other opportunities or things that you do can introduce you to other new things. And so it was just kind of me like paying attention to what was going on in my organization. Um, what's really interesting is now there's like a California state law that if you petition, for the formation of like a student board in your district, and the district has to like consider that petition um, and whether they want to form one. It's always interesting, like you could always petition your school district to say like, hey, I want to form a student board, and um, maybe you can start your own student board. So it's just um, being really active and being willing to do opportunities like that. Um, the opportunity for CASC though was something that I found myself. Um, I found that application online because CASC was very involved with the student board member um, position. They were actually the ones who helped create it. And so they were very involved with the student board member position. Um, and I knew that I wanted to apply for it because um, it was something I was very interested in doing. And so that was an opportunity I kind of find my, found myself through being a finalist for the student board member. Uh, you do have to be a junior, though, to apply for the student board member. Um, and it's a paid job. Yeah. How did you come the idea to apply for Oxford? Um, so I originally it was because I knew that Oxford ran a very good like pre-med program and um, throughout ninth grade and tenth grade I really wanted to do pre-med and be a doctor which was an idea I completely changed like halfway like the mid middle of junior year because I realized like being a doctor is very, very time consuming uh, because you basically work like 18 hours and then the other six hours are for sleeping if you're lucky enough to have that. Um, but I was originally interested in Oxford because I knew they ran a very good pre-med program. Um, but then I knew that their biology department in general is very strong and so I looked on their website for majors that I would be interested in and I was very interested in biochem. So I decided to take the risk to apply to Oxford because like what was the worst that could happen? Like they reject me, like okay, that happens to everyone and it's um, the consequences of being rejected I could handle, but I was going for that chance of um, getting accepted. Um, the other thing was that Oxford doesn't care about GPA. Um, the reason being is that because you're, you're an international student in the US, what they want to see is your standardized, standardized testing because that's what that they can compare you to uh, to other English students for is like AP or IB or SAT 1 and 2 um, and I had very good test scores so I sent them in to Oxford and um, it was a very easy application the personal one writing one essay for a college like once you hit college application season and you realize you only have to write one essay like you feel great like Stanford has like four MIT has like six Caltech like MIT has like five, Oxford has one, but the deadline for Oxford is in October because they are um, doing interviews in December. Yeah. Um, for your art um, nonprofit, did you go to like local schools or like how we, you? Uh, we went to the local homeless shelter. Um, we did free classes there. Um, because the kids there are homeless, they live at the shelter. And so the shelter wanted them to have like different activities to do. Um, so we volunteered to teach at the shelter. We also organized classes with the local library um, for like after school sessions and a lot more students would come to those. I have a question like just about what is your personal opinion about school like band programs or music programs? I think that band and music programs are, um, I've never like been a part of them personally because I'm not very good at piano, um, which is what my mom wanted to do, wanted me to do, and I was like, mom, I can't do this, no. Um, but I think that the band programs are very enriching to do, and um, like being part of the band is like, in, in a sense, like almost being part of a sports team because you are part of the teamwork. But I would say like um, showing commitment to band for like four years also shows a lot to colleges. It shows like your passion for band. 
I think it would also be interesting to maybe like do something with it outside of school as well. Uh, like half of, not even half of my activities were in school. Majority of my activities were out of school. But I think it's important to be part of your school community and part of your city, district, state community. Which arts uh, program are you attending on school? Um, I go to a private teacher. Her name is, uh, it's a UMAZE Center for Artistic Inspiration. Um, I like her because uh, she got her art degree in the U.S. and so she really understands like the U.S. education system, which is why she really pushes for students to do like different competitions because it gives like tangible awards for colleges to look at. Um, and she also has a lot of good resources for competitions like international, national, statewide ones. And, um, she puts a lot of emphasis on creativity, which I think is very important, like developing your own style, because that needs to show throughout your portfolio if you do choose to send one to a college. Like, the portfolios, they look for skill and style. And if you only have skill, that's not good. And if you only have style, like, that's okay, but like, if your art isn't, it doesn't show a lot of skill, then it, like, anyone can develop a style. But like, skill and style are two things that she emphasized a lot, which I really appreciate. Yeah. How did you spend your summer time? So my summer, my ninth grade summer, I didn't know do anything because I was a freshman. I had no idea what I was doing with my life. Uh, my summer after sophomore year, I did a lot of um, curriculum writing. I set a lot of groundwork for the nonprofit organization, for the Olympiad club that I was starting, um, and I did a lot of groundwork for that so that I could kind of start the school year running. Um, and really like push forward with those organizations. Uh, my junior year summer is when I really knew what I wanted to do. And so junior year summer, I, um, <clears throat> I volunteered at a hospital, I worked at a clinic, I did my research with Thoratech, and I also fulfilled my state council duties um, for CASC by going to different camps and um, being a counselor at different leadership conferences. And so that summer was definitely very busy. Um, I went to work at the clinic pretty much every day except Mondays when I would volunteer at the hospital in San Francisco and I would drive myself to San Francisco. I would intern um, at least once a week um, and CASC camp was uh, two weeks and meeting, doing leadership conferences was like a whole day, uh, was a two day commitment where I would go around and I would teach other high school students and run workshops for them. And so junior year summer is when I really decided to do a lot more because I was really confident in what I was interested in and wanted to do. Which year you would take the SAT? I took the SAT in December of my junior year. Um, I'm not, I didn't, I didn't find SAT prep classes to be very helpful. The only thing that I really got out of them was how to write the essays to get a good score. And now the SAT has changed, um, and there's no more essay on it. Um, but I did not spend too much time on SAT prep. I knew that I was good enough at math and writing, uh, math and critical reading to hit higher scores. And so it was only the essay that I really carried out. Um, but majority of my SAT subject tests, I took junior year, um, and I took physics and bio my senior year. Uh, they weren't, and the reason I did that is because I was like, oh, I'll wait till like I finish AP classes and I'll do them. But then I realized like the AP classes and like the AP curriculum and what the SAT subject tests test you on are like completely different things. Um, because AP Physics has now split into AP Physics 1 and 2. And so 1 is like kinematics, like, you know, motion. AP Physics 2 is like electricity and mag uh, magnetism. The subject test is motion, magnetism, and electricity. And so like for that, you do have to do like a bit of self-studying. But I, um, the good thing about physics is that the curve is very high, um, but it is something you need to self-study for. Same with um, the biology SAT, there is no curve. So if you miss a question, you get like one question, you get like a 790 like I did. I think I missed like one question. Um, and it's very different from AP because AP tests have moved towards like critical thinking whereas SATs are still a little bit memorization based for biology, in my opinion, at least. For, um, for, 
for um, in order to run like clinical trials, you do need an MD PhD. Um, and if I down the line I choose not to do that program, I would also be interested in working in like a computer science heavy industry. Um, even though when I was little, I told my dad like, Dad, I'm never going to do computer science like you do. You just sit at a desk and look at a computer screen. Um, but it, I do think computer science is something that's very relevant today because it's becoming a big part in every science field. Like if you look at physics, a lot of research and modeling they do is with computers, chemi chemical engineering, you can run simulations, and it's a very big part of biology now, especially with the advent of 3D printing um, <clears throat> and how you can create artificial organs. I'm very interested in creating artificial organs and kind of coding them um, because it's really simple. Um, especially, um, they've done it with like neurons over in Switzerland. They've created an artificial neuron and like coded it so that it works like a natural one. And so that's the kind of field that I'm also interested in. But if I choose a different path, my major is flexible enough for me to go to computer science or biology or both. So do you do like coding when you're like, um, so coding, coding. <laughs> uh, when I was younger, I didn't enjoy coding that much. I thought it was like, not too challenging. I was like, oh, this is like pretty fun, but I, I knew it wasn't something I wanted to do. I'd always been interested in uh, biology in the sense of like helping others with illnesses and things like that when I was younger. Um, a lot of it started with like being on a soccer team and like dealing with like nursing problems. Like I was, uh, I always helped a teammate who was injured. Um, and so I knew I was very interested in like the medical field. I just didn't know what. And my interest kind of evolved over the years as uh, I saw all the cool things you can do with computer science, especially when I did robotics, um, because basically every move of your robot is programmed by you. Um, and I was always really proud when we would run like an autonomous program, which is when your robot follows only the program that you use and you don't use remote controls, and like it would work out. And so like I knew that like oh computer science is something that is very relevant. And then when my dad realized that, he was like, oh, I've drawn her to the other side. But yeah, I um, my interest kind of evolved over the years. I so, did so you do coding when you're in robotics. Yeah, I did a lot of coding. Um, I also take AP Computer Science in high school, so that was definitely something as well. Yeah. Any suggestion for for students before high school? Um, for students before high school, so. A lot of it is seeing what that student is interested in because uh, a lot of things that you do in middle school, you can continue throughout high school and it really helps you like build that foundation. Like I originally started robotics in middle school and it just kind of continued throughout the years. It was something that I was like used to doing. Like I was like, it's weird going like a year without the robotics season. Um, but definitely in middle school and kind of figuring out what you're interested in trying as many things as possible because colleges don't know necessarily what you do in middle school and so it's a good time in middle school to try out a lot of different interests and if you like it then continue it throughout high school yeah um so like how did you like start did you just like oh like in high school did you just like start a club or did you like have an idea and just like want to start a club or was it um a lot of it was because so like when my school originally registered for the or we like registered for the biology olympiad like people wanted to do it but like no one knew how hard it was going to be yeah because we were like oh ap bio is already like hard enough we can do this test and we all sat down to the test and people were like well, what is this question like i don't know how to do any of this so that helped me like come up with the idea of like doing a club to not just like raise awareness for this test because it was very new to be honest a lot of people were scared by it the first time they ever took it because they didn't have as much preparation um, but like part of it was like to raise awareness but also help students prepare for it and make it less intimidating. So um, I started the club and then um, the year that I started the club, we had double the number of semifinalists. We literally went from one to two. Um, but it was a big leap because before we had, we would have like 20, 30 students take the test. Um, and that year I was the only one who qualified for the semifinalists. The next year we had less students take the test because a lot of kids were scared of it. Um, but we did do some prep and so we had another semifinal. Um, and so it was kind of just like, if I didn't raise awareness for the test, like I didn't want to be the only one sitting there taking the test, um, but it's also just like a lot of kids also can benefit from the test, kids who are interested in biology as well. Like this is also something for them to do. Um, how did your 
find some voluntary activities in the hospital? Um, so for UCSF, they run a student summer volunteering program every year. So I did apply for that. I went through orientation and I worked there for a while. Um, the Tri-City Physical Therapy Center, my friend's aunt owned it and uh, she was looking for internship opportunities so I asked right away if I could and she knew that um, I was qualified when I applied. And so I did do a lot of volunteering there. Um, but majority of my volunteer, I graduated, I'm graduating with 549 volunteer hours. A lot of it came from robotics because my high school team, we chose to mentor um, a middle school robotics team. And so like mentoring the team, mentoring a younger team doesn't just like put you ahead in the robotics competition in high school because the judges like to see that you're teaching little kids. There's also a great volunteer opportunity and it's, um, I think colleges are very happy when you volunteer to teach. It shows a lot of compassion. It shows a lot of patience and dedication and a real love for learning. Um, and so that was one of the volunteer opportunities that um, really gave me most of my hours. Um, as well as um, doing the art nonprofit because um, running that nonprofit, I taught classes two, three times a week. Um, and I always put a lot of time into it. And so the volunteering hours just kind of added up over the years. Um, but a lot of it is kind of just like going out into your own community. Like I'm, uh, the homeless shelter that we worked for is called Abode Homeless Shelter, and they do have branches um, all over the bay. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Um, which APs did you study for, and like, did you recommend? It? I did. Okay, so my sophomore year, I did AP European History, <coughs> AP Biology, and AP Chinese. I'm a native speaker for AP Chinese, so it was pretty easy. Even though like the night before the test, my mom was like, you're going to get a two, your pinging sucks. And I was like, thanks, mom. Um, but I ended up with a five, which was because I'm a native speaker. Um, biology. So there's been.